So here is our agenda for today. Uh, we'll have Ben Backwell, CEO of the Global Wind Energy Council, followed by Helen Durhurst from uh, Bloomberg NES. We'll then have Sam Kimmins come in from RE100, and finally Bruce Douglas uh, from Euroelectric uh, to provide background on corporate sourcing models, and then we'll end with the Q&A. With that being said, I'll pass it off to Ben Backwell, CEO at GWEC, uh, who will give us a presentation on the role of renewable energy in the global energy transition. Over to you, Ben. Thank you, Elisa. And good morning, everyone. It's, uh, thank you very much for joining us at this uh, important time uh, for uh, the world's um, energy uh, market. Um, if we could go to the first slide, please, um, Elisa. Mm -hmm. So um, I want to um, just be quite kind of big picture in my uh, remarks and it's going to be quite brief. I mean, I mean, I think most of us will understand that renewable energy plays a fundamental role in the energy transition and in getting us to where we need to be in terms of averting um, dangerous or, or catastrophic uh, climate change. Um, and uh, there was very strong momentum, I think, as everybody saw um, over the last year or two years around um, increasing targets and accelerating the pace of, of change. Um, and uh, wind and solar and other technologies were, were starting to kind of ramp up to a higher level of, of ambition. Um, I mean, there's a mountain to climb in terms of where we need to get to in terms of um, being compliant with the IPCC um uh requirements um and that level of ambition i think will continue and governments um you know will continue to see uh, the energy transition as a key uh, policy objective now as we all know i mean we've spent the last um five months now in the middle of the covid uh, crisis and the effects are very dramatic um we were on a call um yesterday uh, with the executive director of the IEA, Fatih Birol, and he said that all the emission, uh, all, all the emission increases of the last ten years have pretty much been wiped out um, by the drop in emissions because of COVID, because there's been such a dramatic uh, fall in um, fundamentally in, in fossil fuel uh, use um, and also in transport. Um, however, he was, you know quite um his message quite strongly was you know this is not good news for us i mean firstly because the whole you know the crisis can't be seen as good news but good news because of the kind of you know the dramatic you know and tragic effect it's had on on human life but also because the energy matrix has not fundamentally changed and um his prediction was that first of all coal uh, approval rates um, we're actually speeding up, particularly in China, was one observation he made. Um, and the whole dynamic of coal in certain key uh, markets, fundamentally in Asia, um, unfortunately is still there, despite the kind of dramatic effect in coal production that we've seen this year um, and in coal uh, generated energy we've seen this year. Um, and his second observation was that transport uh, will come back very, very quickly as economic activity starts to uh, rebound. And we, we very much you know, agree with those perspectives. It's very, very important um, for us to keep uh, climate, um, uh, the climate agenda um, front and center um, and not to be complacent around these you know, very uh, important falls in emissions, temporary falls in emissions that we've, um, that we've seen. Um, I go to the next slide, please. Next slide, please, Elisa. Um, now, the other uh, issue to note uh, here is the health of our, of our industry, of the renewable energy industry, in particular the wind industry. Um, we are being impacted by this. And this is um, whereas you know, we've been impacted far less than oil and gas and coal, uh, this will have an impact. So this was our forecast just based on business as usual before COVID. And as you can see, 2020 was going to be a record year for the wind industry of installations around 7.76 uh, uh, gigawatts. 
Um, now that is not going to be the case, um, mainly because of project delays. Um, um, and we would expect possibly around a 20% um, hit um, on the 2020 numbers. Um, now the question really becomes uh, in the short term, how much of that spills over to 2021? At the moment, we would expect most of those projects you know, not to go away and to, to, to then spill over to 2021. And then we'd, we'd see a much bigger 2021 than what we're seeing here. Um, and the news that we're getting from our members and associations is that the sector is working very hard to catch up and the activity is um, close to normal in some key markets like China. Um, however, there are still supply chain problems, um, particularly around places like India where the lockdown uh, uh, continues. So there's a kind of immediate impact, but then there's also a, a kind of midterm impact which we're already starting to see, which is around energy demand um, and around uh, prices, for instance. Um, so, I mean, this, this uh, COVID you know, has will and, and has caused a dramatic fall in energy demand in many places. Um, and we're seeing governments that base their procurement on um, you know, GDP and energy growth already starting to cancel or scale back um, tenders and auctions. Um, so places like Brazil, for instance, um, um, but this this will this will be something that um, you know has a kind of ripple effect across markets as you know governments um, start to kind of assess um, new forecasts around GDP and, and, and energy demand. So you know action needs to be taken around uh, demand. I mean, there's been lots of good uh, proposals being made by different international organisations around what governments can do. Um, in our view, it's very important that stimulus is not just about um, pumping more money into the economy um, because you know there's there's already a lot of um, investment looking for uh, looking to invest in renewable energy uh, but it also needs to look at uh, demand and uh, project uh, viability and market um, factors as, um, as some of our experts today, experts today will will look into um, very very low prices can also have a, very, a dampening effect on on things like um, uh, uh, PPAs um, and um, again you know um, ensuring um, that markets uh, 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 throw up you know viable uh, prices to allow investment to continue the energy transition is going to be a big big um, issue for us. Um, next slide please. Okay I won't go through this I mean we've yeah this is we've been uh, coordinating um, the industry's response to COVID and trying to push for uh, you know, necessary um, um, kind of operating conditions, extensions of commissioning deadlines, for instance, uh, but also things like extending feed in tariffs in some markets, some key ones being places like China and, and Vietnam. Um, and also just talking to government around some of these demand side uh, um, issues around market design. I mean, for instance, the idea of, you know, things like CFDs um, uh, to ensure some kind of market stability around prices. So that work continues. Um, next slide, please. Um, now, I wanted to just say just, just a few quick words around corporate sourcing before um, I hand over to um, uh, our experts here. Um, I mean, first of all, within this picture I've painted around demand, I think corporate sourcing um, is going to play a really, really important role. Um, you know, we know that there's this strong appetite for clean energy uh, from you know, really the leading uh, corporations in the world and, and particularly those that have um, any kind of interaction uh, uh, with, um, you know, customers. Um, but also, you know, uh, heavy industry as well, um, you know, in, in part due to the excellent work that have been done by people like RE100. Um, and that trend will very much continue. I mean, if one thing's clear out of this whole crisis is that people and young people in particular, you know, want to have clean energy and they want to have a, a world as we recover um, that's built upon a, a, a sustainable energy matrix and, um, the sustainable economy. So demand will continue and it's very important that <clears throat> you know, we work together to try and articulate that demand 
and to create um, uh, uh, the you know the market frameworks so that demand can become um, concrete um, and grow um, in the places where there's already a framework for corporate sourcing, but also in many markets where there's not a framework yet or where the framework's just emerging. And in particular, I would mention Asia as being a key uh, place where, I mean, A, it's a, a strategic place for the energy transition because of the importance of coal. Um, renewables uh, needs to speed up in its adoption in many, many um, Asian countries, with the exception really of, of China. Um, and <clears throat> um, so I think the work in Asia around uh, corporate uh, sourcing is going to be really, really important. Um, you know, there's a, there's a first and a hunger um, for uh, clean energy among um, the kind of um, companies which governments are going to be looking to to invest um, as we go to a, a post-COVID recovery. Um, and so I'm really, really you know, hopeful and optimistic uh, that that's going to play a big part in, in, in recovery. Um, I'll just mention quickly, just to finish, we, as an industry, published a couple of weeks ago a global statement on green recovery uh, with the leading uh, companies in our uh, sector. Um, and we are working with our partners to really uh, intervene in a series of kind of, of key forums um, over the next uh, 12 months. Uh, to try and get these, this message across um, um, uh, as, as clearly as possible that we can really contribute and play a, 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 a central role in, um, in economic recovery. So I think um, what we're discussing today is, is, a, is a very important part of that. So thank you very much. I'll, I'll leave it there. Thanks a lot, Ben, for that. I'll now hand it over to Helen Durhurst from uh, Bloomberg NEF, who will give us uh, Bloomberg NEF's forecast for the global corporate uh, PPA market. Over to you, Helen. Thanks, Alyssa. Um, hi, hi, it's, it's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I work in um, at Bloomberg NEF, which is an organisation looking at the renewable energy transition, and within it, I cover how corporates are taking part in this um, in this exciting trend um, and movement, even, um, and and look at the ways that company um, ways that companies are buying renewable energy. Um, so, if we move on to the next slide, um, we've got. Um, Two, two things I want to cover today. Firstly, the, the global perspective on what, what corporate PPA growth is, is looking like. And then the second thing is um, how, how it's looking in specifically in emerging PPA markets. Um, so um, on, on to the, the first trend, um, thank you. Um, so if we, if we see these two charts, they, they show very clearly that corporate PPA con activity continues to climb even this year in the face of the, the pandemic. Um, corporations purchased 1.8 gigawatts of clean energy in April, um, and that's actually up 80% over the previous month. Um, this might have been a bit skewed from Earth Day, um, which actually took place at the end of the month, which historically drives up increases in announcements. But there were actually a lot of other deals announced throughout April. So this is a really promising sign. Um, it's a little, you know, the volumes are a little bit behind last year, but um, um, it, it, it does look quite positive so far. So if we look at the next slide, um, you know, why is, why is it looking so positive? Um, it's actually because th there's a lot of demand that, ha that we have to come. Um, if, we, if we take this sample group, which are very representative of, of some of the most ambitious companies in the world, um, all these companies, um, the RE100 member group, have established targets to meet 100% of their demand, um, electricity demand with renewables, and um, will need 210 terawatt hours of clean electricity by 2030. Um, this is a huge demand gap. This is, this is the demand gap between what they currently purchased in certificates, um, on-site generation and PPAs and what they will need. Um, so, you know, these are across 23 different markets, um, creating demand across the world. Um, and, um, and the, you know, to put this into context, the, the demand just in 2020 is, um, equivalent to slightly less than South Africa's power generation fleet. So it really is a huge amount. Um, and 
um, admittedly not all of this necessarily has to be met by PPAs, um, but we, we do reckon that ambition will increase for, from these companies and we see a trend towards more and more PPAs being signed um, in order to meet these targets. So it's, it's sensible to assume that a lot of this will be met through PPAs. Um, and what does this mean in terms of actual wind build? Um, if we move on to the next slide, we can see um, this actually would catalyze um, we, we, we think, um, for, from our modelling, this will catalyse 105 gigawatts of new solar and wind build globally by 2030. Um, this is if the members relied solely on off-site solar and wind PPAs. So it's a best case scenario, but um, you know, this is more than the UK's 101 gigawatt power fleet. So um, it's, it's really significant. Um, and almost 20 gigawatts has been signed. Um, uh, well, there's 20, 20 gigawatts of um, existing PPAs that, um, and, and solar and wind build have already been catalyzed by RE100 members. So it's actually not a million miles away to, to think that, you know, uh, uh, um, we could get a lot of this way to, to reaching that 100 gigawatt milestone. Um, of this, um, wind we think would comprise the remaining 44 gigawatts um, and um, this, this is just based on on the historical trajectory so far um, it, it could change but um, but th that's about the figure that we we see it's 2030. Um, so yeah if we go on to the next slide um, <clears throat> then we can see so overall, I think demand really remains strong. Um, if, we're, if we're looking to, to try and get a forecast on this um, and to try and, try and see where activi whether activity grow, um, I think you know, these are our short, medium and long term, if you like, um, you know, considerations of what might happen. Um, I think the, the, the biggest danger is that companies um, business continuity is is um under threat that they're put under credit risk um that that you know the longer the pandemic goes on i think the more um the, the more the more business risk um that both developers and off takers will take uh, entering into these agreements companies might not know what their future power demand is um i think that's probably the bigger dr biggest driver of uncertainty that could dampen demand but actually um, I've spoken to quite a few off-takers um, since the, the pandemic's really taken hold and there's, there's a lot of optimism um, and there's a lot of determination to fulfil promises that were made um, and, and a lot of enthusiasm for governments that, that um, want to build back better and companies are really trying to follow suit. So um, I think if anything, you know, for, for some sectors um, who weather the storm slightly better than others, um, actually that it shouldn't make too much of a difference or if anything it could it could spur them on um, and you know if we look at technology companies for example that they're, they're going to continue to build power hungry data centers i i think you know there, there are definitely areas of demand that you can show um won't be as affected by the pandemic and um and so those in industries will continue to to, to sign up to ppas um, the thing if we move on to the next slide that i think it's been most affected is actually ppa pricing um so this is something that's quite difficult to to really um to really get a hold of because the the pricing world is is but you know all all agreed behind closed doors there's non-disclosure agreements but we we did do a, um, a recent survey where we we found pricing for um uh, onshore wind and solar for nine different markets in europe and um, it was it was very much based on a range. Um, this is the base case for the UK, which um, is, is outlined in the notes at the bottom. What what a base case actually means, um, um, because you know we needed some way of sta um, standardising the um, what a typical PPA looks like. Uh, as many of you will probably know that that doesn't really exist. But we for, for the purpose of the exercise we tried, um, and. Actually, what was really interesting is um, this data was collected in Q1 2020, but pretty much as soon as it was published, the, the pandemic hit and, and actually um, 
Zygo, who are our data partner for this, they're, they're an online PPA platform, they told me um, that, that they had done an, uh, they'd run an active online tender and they, they'd seen prices up to four euros lower um, than the prices that they had given me for, for my data, um, for, for my data collection exercise. Um, so that was really interesting because, you know, you could already see the effects of the panic, um, pandemic feeding through in, into what people were prepared to bid. Um, and I think if anything, it's just made it quite a competitive environment. Um, and developers may be uh, happy to sort of drive down margins in, in order to, um, to, to, to in, in line with revised um, power price forecasts, for example, um, which, um, you know, is, it's just one, um, one example, but I, I think price will definitely um, be, be revised more closely. And, um, and also I think the structure of deals will, um, will be looked at much more closely. There might be more cap and collar structures and um, insurance products to, to make sure that price volatility is, um, is hedged properly. And also um, a much closer look at force majeure clauses. Um, will 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 probably be some of the bigger outcomes of of all of this. Um, so now, if we move on to um, the next section of what I wanted to talk about, um, so what is the growth potential in emerging corporate PPA markets specifically? Um, and for the purposes of today, um, if we move on to the next slide, I I've actually I, I sort of I really want to focus on Asia Pacific, which is um, also the focus of this webinar series. Um, I will mention at the end a, a few other markets that I think are interesting, but um, you know, this is, um, th this is an area where, as Ben rightly outlined at the beginning, you know, it's, it's a real area of focus for the energy transition. And I think it's really important that um, Asia Pacific comes along um, with, with the rest of the world. Um, and so far, you know, it's, it's been, it's been a little bit behind um, and 2019 was certainly a dis disappointing year. Um, um, but, you know, there is potential there and there's a lot of other, um, there's a lot of other procurement mechanisms going on and a lot of demand, um, certainly from the RE100 group, you know, there's been a very strong growth in Australia in particular and Japan, as I'm, I'm sure will be outlined in more detail later. Um, but, um, you know, India and Australia are really leading the way in this market. And there's, there's a lot of positives to take away from, from this leadership. Um, so, you know, we've, we've even had a PPA in, in China um, and it's, it's fairly regional on, on what is allowed, but certainly provinces are opening up to the idea of, of corporate PPAs and, um, and the regulations are relaxing. Um, we're, we're seeing a sort of a shift towards um, being more open to bilateral contracting. Um, and I, I just wanted to highlight in particular that um, India is doing really well. Um, we, uh, um, we, we see a lot of um, group captive deals um, under the open access mechanism which which has been really successful initiative um and if you don't know much about it um I, I would be very very happy to discuss afterwards but um it's a really good example of an initiative that can really trigger um of, of how policy really opens the door to um to a really flourishing market and, and could definitely be copied elsewhere um and um <clears throat> yeah if we move on to the next slide um, I think if we if we then sort of turn our attention to the rest of Asia, um, Asia Pacific, outside India and Australia, um, the real issue is that um, for offsite PPAs is is that they really fall at the first hurdle. So, as I mentioned, China is province dependent, um, and 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 then uh, we've got it's it's um, enabled in Australia and India, and then also Singapore really countries fall at the first hurdle because the regulation isn't there so um i think it's really important that governments um look at this um and companies continue to work with governments to um 
as, as for example, Google did in Taiwan to, to make this possible. Um, and also, um, you know, there are other um, mechanisms that are available. So it, it really, there is a lot of promise in these markets um, and, and there's, there's a lot of momentum there, but um, I hope this, this chart is a useful reference um, to take away to, to show what options are available and, and where progress needs to be made still. Um, and then if we move on to the final slide, so um, as I mentioned earlier, I, I also want to just quickly touch on um, other regions outside Asia. Um, it's quite, quite a busy map um, of, of lots of different um, countries. Um, um, you, you can see that there's a lot of activity going on outside Asia as well, um, but I think for the purposes today, we're, we're going to focus mainly on that region. Um, but as, as you can see here in particular, um, Latin America and Central America are really thriving PPA markets, um, and, and there's a lot of promise from, from them as well. So with that, I'm, um, thank you very much for listening, and I'm, I'm going to pass back to Alyssa. Thank you so much, Helen, for that super interesting presentation and overview. I will now pass it off to Sam Kimmins, who is head of the RE100, um, part of the climate group, uh, who will provide some more de uh, details on the corporate sourcing in emerging renewables markets. Over to you, Sam. Let me unmute you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alyssa, and uh, thank you for uh, the great introduction, Ben and, uh, and Helen. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the RE100 group and take a, not a, not a very deep dive, but uh, as much as a deep dive as, as, as possible in 10 minutes um, into some of the, the markets that Helen um, mentioned in her presentation. So next slide, please. So, um, a little bit about the RE100 for those who don't know us. Uh, RE100 now numbers 235 of the world's most influential corporations, all committed to 100% renewable electricity for their global operations. Um, together, they represent around 200, uh, 230, 240 uh, um, terawatt hours of renewable electricity demand, which is approximately the size of Indonesia. So a fairly influential group with significant demand, putting that against world demand is about 1% of, of global demand for electricity. And the next slide, please. Now, traditionally, RE100 companies have been, you know, companies joining RE100 have been um, UK, uh, uh, European and US headquartered, but we're seeing a shift. We're seeing uh, the biggest growth we saw um, in 2019 was in Asia Pacific, um, largely um, Japan, China, Taiwan, and Australia. And this is an area of increasing importance to RE100, uh, to RE100 members, to, to, uh, to, to corporates. Um, not just the, the corporates who are headquartered there, but also the companies who are headquartered in, uh, in Europe and the US who have operations in Asia. There's a really strong focus on the region. Now, a quick word on COVID. Um, a number of, um, a number of uh, uh, commentators have been keeping an eye on RE100 saying, well, you know, is it going to break? Are we going to uh, are we going to start losing members? Are companies going to, um, you know, is this a fair weather commitment that, that companies drop out of as soon as the, the hard times hit? Well, we, you know, we recognize that a number of our, uh, RE100 companies are going through quite difficult times. You know, it's a very challenging time. We're delighted to say that RE100 continues to grow. So um, uh, just before the pandemic hit, we were at 221 members. We're now at 235 with companies such as Chanel and MasterCard joining. So we're delighted to see that corporate commitment to renewables isn't dropping. Uh, there may be some delays in deals. There may be some delays in companies achieving their targets, but more companies are joining and we'll be seeing a number of companies this year announcing achievement of 100% renewable. So looking very strong. So uh, back to Asia. Today I'll, I'll be talking about four Asia Pacific countries. These are not the only important areas, they are not the only important growth markets. 
Um, we also have a strong operation in India um, and um, Africa should not be should not be forgotten. Although you know, it, it, it's it's not really on, on the map for a number of companies for corporate sourcing. We see that changing in the very near future. So we will be looking at setting up our operations in Africa, in South Africa as well. But um, for today, we're talking about Asia. Next slide, please. Now, Asia, as Helen alluded, is um, an ambitious late entrant in the in the PPA game. And, uh, you know, as you'll see from this graph from Bloomberg, Bloomberg New Energy Finance, most of the PPA activity has been happening in the USA um, by significant uh, margin uh, with Europe uh, a um, catching up slowly but surely and then volume and volumes in Asia gradually picking up. Um, it's certainly the one to watch in terms of new emerging markets. Next slide please. I'll talk about a little bit about why that is. Um, now I'm going to talk about four markets, Korea, Japan, Taiwan and Vietnam, three of which we have operations in with, with RE100 and uh, the first three and the, the fourth uh, we're working with the Clean Energy Investment Accelerator. So um, Korea is probably one of the, the um, more challenging markets for corporate sourcing in that it's pr pretty much impossible to buy renewables in Korea and I think this is this is the, um, yeah, the, the, the we're watching Korea as when things change there, we'll, we'll see some very rapid change in the region. And we're delighted to, uh, to note that the Democratic Party Climate Manifesto included uh, a zero carbon pledge and RE100, RE100 named in their manifesto um, to support large scale investments in, in renewable electricity and a, a certificate scheme, the KRIGO, will be launched in June. So this is a great start to a long journey for Korea, but very promising. And you'll see the photo on the right, top right, the ruling, the Democratic Party won by a landslide uh, last uh, a couple of months ago. And so they are in a very strong position to make good on their promise to, um, uh, to provide support for companies sourcing renewables and make good their zero carbon pledge. So uh, really positive news from Korea, very early days. We will be running a webinar with our local partner, KSNRE, on the 3rd of June. And uh, I don't have the website there, but we'll see if we can get the, the invite out to people who want to find out more about Korea. Next slide, please. Taiwan is one of the more uh, advanced markets in the region. Uh, with the TREC providing credible tracking of renewable electricity and corporate PPA is now possible. Uh, two notable cases, Google uh, inked the first, uh, first corporate PPA in, um, in Taiwan in 2019 with 10 megawatts of solar in Tainan City, closely followed by, um, by TCI. Um, a, a health company in um, a local Taiwanese company who was the first Taiwanese company to sign a renewable PPA. Um, so things are happening. Uh, it's a very new market, but we are seeing some ambitious, um, ambitious progress. Alongside this, the industry, the, the non-corporate uh, purchasing industry, wind industry, is growing enormously. So the direct, direct supply to utilities uh, with a huge ambitious offshore wind um, uh, uh, offshore wind pipeline uh, with 5.5 gigawatts planned by 2025 and 10 gigawatts by 2036. Now with offshore, offshore wind is not the primary target often for corporate PPAs so we haven't seen any, any of those yet but as, as scale goes up and prices go down we anticipate a lot more interest from corporates in this sector of the market. So Taiwan certainly one to watch. Next, please. Now, moving across to Japan, Japan is a very interesting market because um, it's, it's somewhat ahead of Korea, but still quite challenging to buy renewables. And yet we've seen the biggest growth in our RE100 membership has been in Japan, with now 34 Japanese companies joining RE100, including um, Aeon, the, um, the retailer, uh, household names such as Sony, 
um, Fujitsu, etc. If you can move to the next slide, please. Now, um, if you want, if you want to see a briefing on this, we we recently released a briefing. I'm afraid the the web address there is wrong. It's just re100.org. We've actually shipped to a new server, so re100.org, and go to the reports and briefing section, and you can get the the full details of what's happening in Japan right now. Now, as as Helen um, as Helen's slide, um, table clearly showed. Um, on-site generation, on-site PPAs are the big game in town in Japan at the moment and um, because it is very difficult to do off-site PPAs at the moment. There are some off-site sort of PPA type deals. So for example, um, the Secretary House who provided solar for the, um, they helped create the, 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 the solar roof revolution in Japan associated with their FIT scheme. Now that the fit scheme has run out, they're now harvesting the, the so buying the solar from those rooftops in the secondary market uh, to to, um, to green their own operations. So there are some great innovation going on, but generally the Japanese market is very much focused on on site. Um, with, for example, IKEA um, in, in Aichi Prefecture installed a 1.3 megawatt rooftop solar plant in 2017. Um, Sony is currently installing 1.7 megawatts of solar, uh, solar PV um, in its warehouse in Shizuka. Uh, Shizuka. So um, there are there's plenty of activity going on um, on the on on site. Next slide, please. Oh, I'm, uh, I, I'm missing a slide here, but the. Um, this is this has uh, this strong growth in PPAs has stimulated the um, uh, the Japanese government to include RE100 support in their COVID um, in their COVID response package with one billion dollars of um, of support for on-site renewable P corporate PPAs. So we will be running a webinar on that when the details of that support have been released. And we are working with the government to look at how they can expand that support and open up their market to off-site PPAs. Um, it's a very quick race through another market. Uh, so moving down to Vietnam. Vietnam has an active PPA market, largely on-site at the moment, but with emerging um, off-site PPA deals. Um, to get more information on this, I would strongly recommend going to the Clean Clean Energy Investment Accelerator website with the address provided on the slide. Um, there are uh, the challenges in Vietnam are those associated with the maturing market. So there are different there are different and more advanced stage of development than Japan, um, uh, and slightly ahead of Taiwan. Um, the level of risk there are challenges. For example, the level of risk that's shouldered by developers. Um, the the need the lack of local experience in project development and um, a need for streamlining streamlining of permitting but again Vietnam is very much a market to watch over the next uh, over the next couple of years next slide please so why is all this happening and why is there so much interest in uh, in Asia at the moment well one of the things we're seeing is a lot of the RE100 members have achieved their goals in Europe and the US and they're, they're looking for their next market. You know, as part of their commitment, they need to achieve 100% renewable electricity in every market in which they operate. And um, they've done it where it's relatively easy, um, where the cost savings can be had, and now are, are setting their sights on achieving the same in, in Asia. Obviously, it is a challenging market, but a number of things that are, uh, as, as well as the, the need to achieve 100%, a few other things that are creating the change. Companies are increasingly asking their suppliers to use renewable electricity, and that is having a profound impact in Asia. Um, this is uh, on the slide, you can see a quote from uh, RE100 member ASCO, um, an office supply company. Um, when they joined RE100, they saw a, a huge uptick in international, international trade. Um, by declaring their, their RE100 intentions, uh, they opened their passport to the world. 
And we're increasingly hearing this from companies. And the reason for this is companies like BT, Apple, Walmart, um, IKEA are asking their suppliers to use renewable electricity and are giving preference to suppliers who use renewables. It's also attractive for governments, um, not least because it strengthens the, the, their supply base. Here's a quote from uh, President Tsai of Taiwan from November 2019. Our, this was in her industrial policy keynote. RE100 is a critical consideration for industrial policy. Um, so they're saying this is achieving RE100, uh, enabling companies in their countries to achieve RE100 is very important for industrial success. It's also very important for attracting some of the 98 billion in investments that, um, that Helen mentioned in her earlier presentation. The RE100 companies are investing at scale in renewables and whether that goes, whether that, that money is spent in, uh, in Europe, in the US, in Taiwan, in Japan, in Australia, etc. Where it's spent is all dependent on how friendly the local policy is to corporate renewables. And countries are increasingly waking up to that opportunity and are looking to be well positioned to secure investment um, through and after the pandemic. So thank you very much. That's a very um, quick leap through some of the key points of uh, the key growth areas that we're seeing in, in, um, in RE100. So I shall hand back to Alyssa. Thanks a lot, Sam, for, for that overview and, and deep dive into corporate sourcing in uh, some major APAC markets. Um, for our last presentation, I'll hand it off to Bruce Douglas, who is the Director of Business and Communication at Your Electric, who will provide an overview of the different models available for corporate sourcing of renewable energy. Over to you, Bruce. Hi, Alyssa, and thanks to you, Eric, and RE100 for inviting me today. Um, there's a lot of slides that are included here, um, but I know they're going to be circulated to the participants afterwards, so don't panic when you see all the details. Um, uh, so yeah, if we could move through the slides, Alyssa. Um, I currently work at Euroelectric, um, but previously I was at uh, Resource Platform, um, which is an alliance of uh, stakeholders active in corporate sourcing. And this is where this information comes from, actually, in a, a report uh, on the introduction of, uh, of corporate sourcing. And it goes through all the, the business models. That's what I'm gonna go through first today. So if we could go through the, the, the first uh, business model. It's split into three sections. So first uh, on-site and then off-site and then um, some variants. So on the on-site, if we go to the next one. And interestingly on on-site, um, the data that Helen was showing was uh, all the PPAs. But in fact, in Europe, almost half the corporate sourcing was done uh, on-site without PPAs. Um, so mainly rooftop solar, but the odd, uh, the odd wind turbine as well on, on, on site. Um, what you see here is the, one of the pages from the report. Um, and not only there's a bit of text, but also you see some graphical uh, uh, elements. Top left, you can see whether the, the business model is self-owned or third party owned, whether it's on site or off site, and whether there, there are geos um, and whether they're bundled or unbundled. Top right, you see the, the graphic of the, the map showing where the business model has been done so far in Europe. And then at the bottom, you see a simple graphic um, it trying to explain the complex nature of each of the business models. Um, in, in simple terms, the, um, the corporate is on the right, um, the project the renewable installation is on the left, the power uh, and geos, if there are any, go from left to right, obviously from, from the project to the corporate, and the money goes from right to left. Okay, um, and for this particular model, the self-owned on-site, um, it's behind the meter, um, as you can imagine on-site, so there's no geos that have been generated. Um, but the positive elements of this business model are that it can save significant cost. Um, there's no transmission fees, I mean, no um, non-commodity fees um, for electricity. Um, it provides additionality. Clearly, there's new build renewables on site. Um, and with that comes visibility and credibility. So, you know, this is the business model that IKEA use, and they have, uh, you know, millions, literally millions of solar panels on the roof of their, of their shop. Um, and the final positive is that you can actually sell the excess power coming from those, uh, those facilities. 
Um, on the negative side, I mean, it has capex implications. You know, you need to pay for it and, and own it, and so that's either a bank loan or on your balance sheet. Um, it's limited in scale. As you can imagine, the space on site is limited, either your rooftop or your or your car park. Um, and also, the corporate is then also exposed to project risk because they actually own the asset. If we look at the next business model, Alyssa, um, so this is leasing, and it's very similar to on site, except the the Renewable installation is third party owned and the corporate pays a, a leasing fee. The next business model, which is on site PPAs. And again, very similar to again, but here the corporate consumer signs a long term um, PPA with the, uh, with the renewable supplier um, and agrees on the duration of the contract and the price and, and so on. And finally, on site is the, the private wire business model. Uh, this is rare in, in Europe. Uh, yeah, it's the next slide. Um, that's uh, rare in, in Europe and really only present when there's uh, an exceptional circumstance or um, a, weak, a weak grid. I'll give you one example. There's a case study on the next slide um, where there's a solar PV plant with a direct connection to a paper mill in the UK. And that's one example of that, but again, not, not very common in, in Europe. Um, okay, so now we move on to the next uh, group, which is the off-site models. Um, and the first one um, is the physical PPAs. We go to that first business model. Um, and this is very common in Europe. Um, and as Helen showed, it's not so common in APAC yet, in Asia Pacific. Uh, and although this, this report, this whole report was designed um, to show Europe, the business models are actually relevant for, for, for the global markets and, um, and present in most global markets to, to a greater or lesser extent. Um, this particular business model um, involves a direct uh, delivery of uh, electrons, so the physical uh, transmission of electricity to the corporate. The positives are there's no capex, obviously, the, um, it's third party owned, so the corporate doesn't have to uh, buy, uh, pay for the project up front. Um, they can save money um, and there's a fixed price, so they're given visibility on their, uh, on their electricity um, uh, cost over time. Clearly, you can have additionality with this. You can request that it's a new build renewable installation. Um, and the final one is about the, the volumes. With this, you can, you can have significant volumes. So large volumes of, of uh, renewable asset um, can, can then be procured by the consumer. The next one is the financial and virtual PPAs. Um, so I think it's called financial, yeah. Um, otherwise known as virtual. I mean, this is not so um, common in Europe. Um, but it's very common in the US. It's basically it involves no physical transfer of power. Um, and so at the bottom you see there, you need a, a wholesale market or aggregator to supply the power. Um, and it's uh, really a financial instrument um, to, to, so the corporate can hedge um, on the electricity cost. Um, the negative side of it is there are some accountancy issues which are fully explained in, in the resource website. Actually, there's a great report from WBCSD on that. Um, but it's around the issue of uh, project ownership and the corporate obviously um, doesn't want to have uh, the project itself being classified as being owned. Um, that has a huge impact on their balance sheet. So that's important to take into account. Um, the, this financial or, or virtual PPA is actually a, a contract for difference. Um, the corporate and the renewable provider agree a, a strike price. And um, if the market price is higher, then that strike price, then the power producer pays the corporate. And if the market price is lower, then the, the corporate pays the power producer. Um, relatively simple concept, but um, you know, it takes some time for corporate to get comfortable with these new instruments. And I think we'll see that grow significantly in Europe and around the world and in Asia uh, over the coming years. Um, and then finally, the, the variant. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, the cell phone off-site is very similar to the cell phone on-site, as you can imagine. Um, but clearly the project is located elsewhere and you need that wholesale market again to provide the power. Um, here, in this case, geos are generated um, by the project and supplied to the corporate consumer. The next one is the multi-buyer PPA. Um, and this has uh, got huge potential. 
um, especially for large scale projects. So you can imagine an offshore wind farm would require you know, several corporate offtakers to take the power. There's one example is in, uh, in Holland, the Dutch wind consortium, um, I think four corporate uh, club together and signed a single PPA to offtake some, some offshore wind farms. Um, there, the positives are that it spreads the cost and risk between the, the corporates and you can do very large scale deals. Okay, and then uh, finally is the multi-fellow multi uh, PPA. And here it's the other way around. There's several uh, renewable installations and uh, one, one corporate offtaker. The positive here is it reduces the balancing costs uh, for the utilities. Um, the aggregator in the middle takes the risk away from the corporate. Um, and it can be really good for energy intensive. So those corporates have a large energy demand. They can go to multiple local renewable suppliers um, to, to, to get the power. And uh, the next one, cross-border PPAs. This is becoming more and more popular in, in Europe. Uh, as you can imagine, as the market opens up, um, it provides very flexible procurement. You can have a factory in one country and procure power from a different country. Um, but there's still several barriers and it's described in the text, you can read it afterwards, um, several barriers in place in many countries that prevent this happening or make it very difficult. Uh, the next one is uh, multi-technology. And this is where you, the corporate consumer can request um, wind, solar and possibly even storage, battery storage combined. Uh, they're very compatible as you can imagine and uh, that can reduce the balancing risks um, associated with that. Again, it's rare currently in, in Europe. It's very uh, common in, more, more common in the US. Um, but you can see that as a huge opportunity going forward as well uh, to utilize multi tech. Um, and finally, the last uh, slide, I will not go into details of this. This is, uh, goes into even more complex territory, which is um, the proxy generation PPAs. Again, common in the US, not so much in, in Europe. Um, and it's about reallocating risks you know, can use insurance instruments to basically reallocate risk. And there's a lot of discussion around uh, risk uh, mitigation. Um, and it's one of the big topics around corporate sourcing. And if that's done well, it can really unlock the demand and, and projects for corporate sourcing. Uh, the two final slides, I was asked to say uh, a couple of words about uh, deregulation in, in European markets and unbundling. I mean, given the time, I'll be very brief. I mean, deregulation has is, is much happened in Europe um, over the last uh, couple of decades. Um, it brings price convergence between markets. It reduces price uh, because of increased competition um, and it increases security of supply. There's been no instances of um, blackouts during COVID-19 so far. And that's partly due to this European coordination of electricity supply. It also helps reduce CO2 emissions and increases R&D and innovation. So generally a positive step. And as you saw from Helen's slide, you know, deregulation is starting to happen in, in Asian markets. And uh, you'll see that more and more over the coming years. And then the final slide on unbundling. Unbundling clearly leads to increased competition, uh, the separation of generation, transmission and distribution. Um, customers can then easily switch between supplier um, and they can even become a prosumer and, and produce power themselves. This trend generally reduces risks um, and gives a clearer role to the uh, system operators, both the transmission system operators but also the, uh, the distribution system operators. Um, I'll stop there um, and happy to take questions if there are any. Thanks a lot, Alyssa. Thanks a lot for that, Bruce. Um, so we're right running a little bit behind time, but we'll still try to take a couple questions before we close off the webcast. Um, and kind of going off of Bruce's last slide there, uh, we have a question from Janos. Um, Janos, could you introduce yourself and ask your question to the panel? Yes, thanks, Sarissa. Uh, my name is Janos Shetje and I work at First Climate uh, AG in Germany. And first of all, many thanks for, for, for this uh, pretty good uh, presentation and, uh, and the insights for all topics. And my question uh, goes likely to Sam. And it is that uh, whether the, the Korean certificates will be available both in bundled and unbundled form and whether corporates uh, can uh, use it to make renewable energy claims. Thank you.
Thanks, Janos. Um, Bruce or Sam, do you want to take that question? Yeah, so the, the K Rigo um, is, it's got, it will be attached to the, um, so it, it's, it, so K Rigo is effectively an, an unbundled wreck. And um, it, it is, it, 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 it's not an ideal scheme, but it is the start in being able to track, um, being able to track renewable electricity. So um, we'll be giving more detail on that on the 3rd of June. But as nice to say, it, it, it will allow companies to achieve RE100, it will allow them to, to tick the box of RE100. There are some questions over the level of additionality, or the level of you know, attachment to tangible renewables of the, uh, of the scheme. So it is, it's, it is credible. It will allow you to achieve RE100, um, but it requires some work in terms of increasing the attractiveness in terms of the way you know, a company being able, what companies really want is to be able to see, I bought this thing, it has led to the development of this amount of renewable electricity. And we're actually getting the information on that over the next few days that so we can present on our, on our webinar. Thank so, you very much for the answer. So far. Thanks, Janos. Um, we'll take one more question, um, but this person doesn't have audio or video available. Um, so I'll just ask it myself. Um, uh, so this one would be for, for Helen and, and, and maybe Sam as well. Um, we have a couple questions actually about um, the opportunities for corporate sourcing in Latin America, specifically on Colombia and Cuba. Uh, Helen, do you want to start on, on Colombia? Yeah, sure. So um, this is actually a really good question. Um, we see Colombia as a market with serious potential in Latin America. Um, it's got excellent wind and solar resources. Um, and um, more importantly, there, there's a real will from the government to um, to advance the, the sector. So um, they've, um, they've had their first successful auctions held in October 2019. Um, and that was that that resulted in 1.3 gigawatts of wind and solar assets, securing long term contracts with utilities. So um, this will take place in the reg um, this will be in the regulated market, um, and um, and and what's really interesting from a corporate procurement perspective is that most wind farms didn't connect, um, commit their full generation to the re regulated market. So um, we 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 can expect auction winners um, like EDP um, to to also look to sign bilateral contracts with large consumers. Um, so this this will be um it will be interesting to see um what what happens there and, and where the rest of that capacity goes um i'm really sorry i think there was one about cuba as well i actually can't speak to cuba but maybe maybe someone else can um can uh, know, knows about that market in particular Thanks, Helen. Um, I think we're actually at our time now here this morning. So um, for all of the people who answer, ask questions and we didn't have time to answer live, we will follow up via email. And if you have any further questions, you can send a message to info at gwec.net, just here on the bottom left of the screen. Um, on behalf of uh, GWEC, our 100 and all of our speakers today, I thank you for joining our webcast um, and look forward for you to join our webcast, uh, future webcasts in this series focusing on uh, some major emerging APAC markets. Um,